Ellen Reed, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. So we're we're here to talk about um, an excellent book that you co-wrote, right? Yeah. Um, it's and it's it's called uh, Relentless Solution Focus. So three three really interesting words. Um, we think we're well. Hopefully, we'll, we will unpack them. But start by just, uh, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and uh, you know what what you do. What I do. So. I am, I kind of have a little bit of a double life. <laughs> so I start my days off typically as a professional dancer. Um, we're off for the summer right now, but usually I'll start by going into ballet class and then uh, rehearsals after that. And uh, I'm a contemporary dancer here in St. Louis. I dance for the Big Muddy Dance Company. Um, and then I come home and I sit down at my desk and I start getting on coaching calls with clients. So I'm a performance coach, which basically means that I help people who are trying to make improvements in their life, whether that be athletes trying to perform at or above their potential, um, business professionals, leaders, um, teams, organizations. Anybody who wants to make improvements in their life, whether they're struggling or whether they're already performing well and they just want to improve their game. Um, I, as you said, co-wrote the book Rel Relentless Solution Focus with my colleague, Dr. Jason Selk, who I was really lucky to get connected with, gosh, close to 15 years ago now. Um, and Jason kind of got his big claim to fame start as the director of sports psychology for the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team. Um, and I connected with Jason right before he was about to start that position. Mm. And it was kind of being in the right place at the right time. I was in graduate school working on my doctorate in psychology and dancing kind of as much as I could um, on the side then too. And he knew that his business was probably about to get a lot busier and he needed somebody to kind of come on and help with the administrative stuff, like confirming appointments and invoicing and things like that. Um, and so I was like, sure, you know, I love psychology. Oh, That's what I do. That's cool. You know, and um, the, you know, that was 15 years ago. And slowly as I finished my doctorate, um, I started to take on coaching clients as well. Um, and I've been really lucky to really be kind of immersed in the fundamentals that Jason has developed, um, and seeing the success that they've had with the Cardinals and with the athletes and teams and business professionals and been able to teach those fundamentals to my own clients, um, and through this book, Relentless Solution Focus. So, um, that's kind of how I got here today. <laughs> Um, and that's a little bit about my life. I've, I'm a mom. I've got two little boys, an awesome husband. Uh, my kids are six and three. Um, so we're just doing the whole summer thing right now. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I'm imagining that when, when like you started off probably with dance and not coaching, like you weren't like a four year old going to coaching classes. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so what was what was the transition? I mean, first of all, what, what appealed to you about dance? And I don't even know if you can answer that. It probably started yeah. so young. Well, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, I did. I kind of have always for as long as I can remember, I've been dancing. But it's funny because um, this summer I've been, uh, you know, my kids are kind of getting to the age where we're doing more activities now. Um, you know, they're getting into baseball and things like that. And some of the kids, um, William is my oldest. He's a six-year-old and some of his buddies are on the swim team. And the moms were just talking about recently, like, gosh, these practices are so early. And that brought me right back to being younger and my parents signing me up for swim team and remembering how early these practices were and how cold it was to have to jump in the water that early. And it made me really realize that, gosh, one of the big reasons I started as a dancer is because you're inside, you're in air conditioning, um, <laughs> you're never there too early. 
Um, and so really, I think that's kind of how I started. Um, my sister was a dancer growing up. And so I loved to kind of doing whatever she did. Um, and I've always loved dancing, but kind of more than that, I've always loved the, um, just the journey and the process of improving and mm. having something to work for and work on improving and work on fine tuning. Um, and which has really, you know, set me up well to do what I do kind of in the afternoons with coaching others. Um, and so, yeah, it's funny that you asked that question because I was really kind of recently re-realizing that, gosh, one of the reasons I'm a dancer is because I like to be in air conditioning. <laughs> uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a weird answer, honestly, because you're, you're talking about like, I did it, you know, partly I did it for convenience and comfort, and yet the process of self-improvement is anything but. Yes. It's kind of the yeah. opposite of convenience and comfort. Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny, again, like watching my kids kind of figuring out what they're into and what they're interested in. Um, it is cool to watch them kind of figure it out. And you see those kids that just seem to be drawn to something right away. You know, w William is on the, the soccer team. And soccer may not be his thing, um, but there's one or two kids on the team where it's their first year on the team and they are just little superstars. Um, mm. And so, you know, I, I think that I'm really lucky that my parents exposed me to this stuff so that I could kind of figure out from an early age, like, gosh, I love this. Um, and in order to put the work and the discomfort into improving, like you said, you've got to love it. Um, and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of inconvenience and discomfort involved in the process. Mm. So speaking about inconvenience and discomfort, you mentioned you got a PhD, mm -hmm. which is kind of a definition of like long hours doing something in a sort of yeah. monofocused way. What made you decide, like, I want either I want to learn more about this for myself or I want to have a degree so that when I'm done with dancing, I have something to fall back on. Like yeah, well, you know, it's an interesting process, kind of what brought me here, too, because I growing up like through high school, through college, I was really the quintessential perfectionist. And I was the kid at lunch and at, we called it flex time, which is kind of like recess in high school. Um, I was a kid that was studying during lunch and flex time, not because I had procrastinated and hadn't done it the night before, but because I was so obsessed with being better and being perfect. Right. And, mm. and I do not recommend, <laughs> I do not recommend this mindset. Uh, but I do credit it with kind of as uh, as I was younger, kind of pushing me to um, now being able to harness this in a much more productive and effective way. Um, but, you know, I think I, I had this as a lot of, as a lot of us do and a lot of the people that I work with do had this drive for perfection. Um, and it's something that's really common in our society. And I was stressed. You know, looking back at it, I was really stressed and it felt so normal to me at the time to just kind of wake up with that, like my heart pounding out of my chest, like thinking about all the things I had to do that day. And, um, okay, am I ready for this? I've got this test on Wednesday and is my health okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that laundry list of things we have going through our minds as a normal basis, it was very normal for me. Mm -hmm. And... I, through working with Jason, you know, kind of started to realize like, wait a second, not only is this not have to be my normal, but I don't have to live like this. And it can be so much better if I don't. Um, and so through that, you know, I just kind of think I just, I just kept on the train. Like I loved academics. I loved dancing. So I just kept doing both. And I, you know, finished my undergraduate. I'm like, what's next? What could be better than getting an undergraduate degree? And it's getting a graduate <laughs> degree. And so I kind of just stayed on the train. I loved it. Um, but I, it just kind of felt like, well, that's what you do next. Um, and I'm really glad I did. Um, but I, you know, I, I can definitely attest to the fact that, that that perfectionist mentality is not beneficial in the long term. Mm. So do you do you also have the dreams like where you have a final exam in a class that you've forgotten oh, yeah. to go to? Yes. 
a hundred percent. Because I, I, I haven't been in school for 30 years. I still get those. I know. And isn't it funny that we were just talking about this the other day that, you know, you and I are having that same dream and these dreams seem to be somewhat universal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so and it's, I, I love how you're sort of, you know, acknowledging that there's a there's a toxicity to it, but also that it's an energy that you can harness and 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 respect as well, because um, I was also a perfectionist as a kid and I handled it completely differently. Like there was a mm -hmm. bunch of things I was good at and I stayed with those. And as soon as there was something that I wasn't good at, I would quit. So like I, t I went to one day of basketball camp and I hadn't played basketball before. And there were kids who were dribbling right. And I was sort of like dribbling, you know, with the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. clunky. And like I got told, like, that's not the way to do it. And I told my dad, I hate basketball. I never want to go back. Right, right. You know, and, and I wasn't a great swimmer. And so I was like in advanced beginners, you know, swim class at camp for like seven years in a row, with, you know. And and like that was a real sort of un dark underbelly of perfectionism is that I sure. felt like anything that I wasn't perfect at was like death. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing about this perfectionist mentality is that we can all relate to it. You know, this is something that as humans, it's kind of part of the way we're wired. We have this problem centric thought as our mm. normal course of thought as humans, where our brain goes to and wants to focus on the problem or where we feel like we're falling short or what we're lacking in life. First and foremost, it's the way that we're biologically wired. And if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, this was a really good thing when we were evolving as a species, right? When there was a time when our resources were much more scarce and our environments were much less stable. So that problem centric thought was really important for us to be able to very quickly recognize the threats in our, our environment. But now, you know, even with all that's going on in the world right now, our environments are so much more stable, our resources are so much more plentiful that this problem centric thought does not serve us in the way that it did. And so it really manifests in us in a way in this perfectionist mentality where we can all relate to, you know, doing 99 things right in a day, one thing less than perfectly. And at the end of the day, you know, when you're driving home from work or when you're reflecting on your day, you know, what's more likely to be on your mind? All the things that you did well or that one thing that didn't go well. And it's yeah. something that, you know, again, we can all relate to it to some level or another. And I would be willing to bet and I am willing to bet a lot of money that all, if not very close to all the clients that come find me and work with me have a lot of this perfectionist mentality kind of coursing through the way they do things where we're really quick to kind of blow off what we do well blow off our successes as expected so maybe you were great at let's say you were great at soccer but you went to basketball camp and you're like well gosh I, i'm not good at this i mean yeah i'm great at soccer but i need to focus over here why am i not good at this like this is awful i'm gonna quit this right or maybe you're, you're good at math and you get an A on your math test all the time, but you're like, yeah, but that's my thing. I really should, like, I'm struggling over here in science. Or I did great on defense today, but that's, again, that's my thing. That's what I'm known for. Like, I can't believe I struck out. It's just the way that we're wired. We blow off what we do well, and we're really quick to beat ourselves up when we fall short. Now, this is okay when we're younger. This is somewhat okay when we're younger, because typically in the lower levels of competition, we have a lot of people above us. We've got coaches, we've got parents telling us how great we are, right? Mm -hmm. Like our, our coaches and, and at the lower levels of competition, when you're pretty good at something, it shows a lot more, right? But as we get into the higher and higher levels of competition, where the competition becomes just as good as you are. And there's fewer people above you telling you how great you are. And then meanwhile, you've learned to really beat the heck out of yourself with this perfectionist mentality. That's like taking a baseball bat to our self-confidence. Over the years, it's like chipping away at our self-confidence. And we're not learning how to maintain our self-confidence and develop our self-confidence for ourselves. 
Now, let me explain why this is such a big deal. Now, self-confidence, scientifically speaking, empirically speaking, they've done a lot of research on this. Self-confidence is the number one variable for all human performance. It's number one, the most important for the way that you're going to perform. And at all levels of competition, this perfectionist mentality is totally detrimental to self-confidence. So people start to notice this as they get into the higher levels of competition. Like, gosh, you know, I used to play so well and I used to not even think twice about this stuff. And now all of a sudden I got to college and my confidence is really starting to struggle. This perfectionist mentality, the way that we've been kind of going through life, our whole lives and the way our brains are wired really starts to become detrimental. So we've got to literally retrain our brains into evaluating ourselves in a way that's productive and not in that perfectionist mentality that I, you know, became very familiar with when I was growing up myself. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because I know you and Jason work with with, you know, real high performers, professional mm -hmm. athletes and people who are interested in that slight edge. Um, what about people who who max out their potential at age six or seven, who aren't gonna, who aren't the great soccer players, who aren't the great dancers, who don't who who don't like it feels like there's a difference between having being told you're great until you're 18 and then hitting a wall and understanding that at age five or six, you're kind of average, yeah. but you're yeah. still, you're still a valuable human being, but you've got this sort of perfectionism that's never being realized. Like what does yeah. that do to a person? So, you know, my favorite clients are real life people, <laughs> right? Well, I shouldn't say my favorite clients cause I love all my clients, but where I, what I should say, what's more accurate to say is that where I feel like I make even more of an impact is with the people who are just trying to make improvements in life, right? I, yes, I work with Olympic athletes. I work with professional athletes. I work with these superstars, but I also work with the 12 year old gymnast who all of a sudden is struggling with their back handsprings on beam or the high school student who's struggling with anxiety or the young adult who is just struggling to figure out what they want out of life and maybe struggling with addiction or any other of the adversity that we experience or not. You know, maybe it's somebody who isn't necessarily experiencing adversity in the way that, you know, like a illness or addiction or anything like that, but they're just struggling with confidence. And it's funny because we think of these superstar athletes and superstar like high achievers as being like aliens, like so different from us, but we're the same. And that's one of the things that I feel really lucky to be able to kind of have firsthand experience with is the people that I work with that are again, like these aliens that have achieved like such high levels of success, they all have problems. And they struggle with the same things that we kind of mere mortals struggle with. And these fundamentals that we work on with these athletes are the same fundamentals that are so impactful for the rest of us, right? Um, and all of us as humans are striving for something, whether it be an Olympic gold medal or the next level in our career or the next level of happiness. And that's where I feel like, you know, I, I, in this book has made the most impact. And that's kind of what was a little bit of a surprise to both Jason and me. I mean, once the book came out is that we started to get messages from people about, you know, this book, and this is going to sound dramatic, but people telling us, you know, this book literally saved my life. Like, mm. you know, I struggled with depression or I struggled with, um, bipolar disorder or addiction and just these simple fundamentals really turned that around for me and made a significant impact. And that's what gets me excited. You know, it's cool to work with the Olympians and that sort of a th sort of thing. But what really gets me excited um, is 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 that is the the real life kind of mortals <laughs> and mm. we're all the same we're built with the same stuff yeah. we struggle with the same stuff yeah so when i think of perfectionism I, as as you're talking about it i'm like 
that's not the right word because <laughs> because that's a positive and it's yeah. almost like what, what what perfectionism really is is like anti-imperfectionism right so it's yes. like i can't like there's i i have to i can't admit to any vulnerabilities and so i will do i will spend all of my energy trying to erase them or or overcome them um and I think, you know, when, when I think about problem centric thought, my my conceptual understanding is that it's, it's essentially a form of fight or flight. Like you said, we yes. grew up in these you yes. know, ancestral environments, which and, and fight or flight is really sort of a misnomer. It should be flight or fight. Right? Yeah. 90 percent of the time. <laughs> yeah, and it's so, flight. <laughs> so it's 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 a, like problem centric thought is essentially avoidant leads to avoidant behavior. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You're, yes, absolutely. And. You're absolutely right that usually it's flight, it's avoidance. And beyond that, and even worse than that, is ruminating on it, right? We get sucked <laughs> in the, into this PCT tornado, you know, kind of one of the better case scenarios is if you do just turn around and go the other direction, but that's not what typically happens. What typically happens when we're experiencing or we encounter a problem is that we think about it. Right. And the more we think about it, the more we think about it and the worse it gets. <laughs> There's this thing called expectancy theory and expectancy theory is a theory in psychology. That's really the basis behind most of what Jason and I do that states that that which you focus on expands. That which you focus on expands. Think about it. Like when you are thinking about or talking about a problem, usually when you start talking about it to your friends, it doesn't happen in the way of like, okay, let me just vent on, on this for two minutes and then be done with it. Usually isn't the way it happens. We like to think that's what the way it's going to go, but usually it gets more and more spun up and turns into a bigger deal and gets emotions about it even more heated, right? That which you focus on expands. It's like if you, um, let's say you're buying a new car. If you've ever had this experience where you're buying a new car and all of a sudden you start to see that same make and model that you've been researching all over the road. <laughs> yeah. That which you focus on expands. When our brains become kind of in tune to what we're focused on, they literally get lit, lit up in relation to that. And so we get so sucked into thinking about our problems that it becomes so hard or even impossible for us to get to the solution side. And that's where this relentless solution focus comes into play. How do you recognize your problem, but then shift your focus from problems to a potential solution quickly enough so that you don't get sucked into that tornado? And it's not the perfect resolution to your problem. It's a potential solution that could improve your problem by just one inch or one iota. It's called the plus one concept in the book. Um, but I, I like to what you said about, you know, perfectionism kind of has a positive connotation when you just think about the word. But what we know to be true is that there's absolutely nothing positive about perfectionism. And, you know, that's, um, well, I take it back. Again, a lot of people's success in the earlier or kind of the lower levels of competition is driven from that drive for perfection. But if we don't attack that and start, doing the things that are going to promote that in a positive and effective and constructive way. It's really going to be a roadblock to your success, but more importantly, your happiness. So what we've got to learn how to do is instead of beating ourselves up for our shortcomings and not recognizing what we're doing well, we've got to learn how to recognize what we're doing well. And we've got to be relentless about keeping our focus on improvement, not perfection. You know, it's such a subtle mm -hmm. difference, improvement and perfection, but that subtle difference has a massive impact. Yeah. And I would say the, the other thing that's really important when you are growing out of perfectionism is to decouple your self-worth from your performance entirely. Totally. Right. Like the, to the, the that whole thing, like you help people with, like, I want to get better. I want to improve. That's wonderful. That's a great privilege of being human. And if we still tie our self-esteem to it, our self-worth yes. or the approval of others, 
I mean, I'm sure you've worked, I'm sure you've seen in the news sort of athletes who, you know, no matter how good they are, yeah. they're only as they're only as worthy as their last performance. Yeah, absolutely. I love uh, it's, it's it's tragic. I, yeah, absolutely. You're right on. And what is what we kind of fight tooth and nail for with teaching our clients is you've got to judge your success on effort and process, not results. And that that's a concept mm. from coach John Wooden effort and process. That's how you judge success, not results. And, you know, coincidentally, the more you're judging your success on your effort and process, the more likely you are to get those results. It's so much more effective, so much more productive to keep your focus on process and your effort, because those are the things you can control rather than the results, right? Like you can control after practice, staying an extra 30 minutes and taking free throw shots, right? Practicing, but you can't control in the game, whether that's going to go in, but you can control how much you prepare for it and how much you practice for it. And what you should judge your success on is whether you got into the gym after practice every day and worked on it, not whether those shots went in. Now, of course, we want the shots to go in, right? I wouldn't have a job if people who came to me didn't experience good results, but we're going to get to those results so much more effectively if we're relentless about keeping our focus on effort and on process. Right. And, and I, you know, in my experience, almost all the time, the less, the lower the st my perceived stakes, the, the lower yeah. pressure I'm under, the better I do. Like I, yeah. I play on an old men's ultimate Frisbee team competitively and our, and our chant before we go out and play is the stakes couldn't be lower. I love that. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Like partly, partly because we don't want to injure ourselves because yeah. we're in our like, late fifties <laughs> and sixties, but partly because, and I felt this for myself, like when I joined the team and I'm trying to prove myself to, you know, to belong in games that I viewed as higher stakes, I would make dumb mistakes. Absolutely. And I, I went to a guy who's been playing for a long time. I asked him for coaching on my performance and I thought he was going to show, teach me about, you know, swiveling my hips or using my wrist a certain way on the back end. And he said, well, when I go out in the field, I just step in the grass and I look around and I think how lucky I am to be playing this sport that I love. Yeah. And I recommend you do that too. I love it. I love and it. It made a huge yeah, impact. Absolutely. You know, our, our thoughts, what goes on between our ears has a huge impact on how we're going to perform. And when we're in these high pressure situations or even, you know, moderate pressure, right? It really doesn't take all that much pressure to create a significant impact in how we're going to perform, right? If we're not prepared for it, if we don't train for it. And so kind of there's two aspects of this. One, what it does to our biology, right? What it does to our body. And when we experience that pressure, it creates a significant in increase in our heart rate. And when our heart rate gets above a certain level, we really lose the ability to execute those fundamentals the way we've been training for, the way we know how to. So we've got to get a hold of our heart rate. And we do that through something called the centering breath, which is this is a really easy tool that anybody out there could start implementing right away really easily. You breathe in for six seconds, you hold your breath for two seconds, and you breathe out for seven seconds. Now, what this does is it's going to get air into your diaphragm. And when you get air into your diaphragm, it's going to have the physiological effect of slowing down your heart rate. So step one, you've got to get your heart rate under control because if your heart rate isn't under control, you really lose the ability to have more control over your thoughts. Now, when you're in those high pressure situations, right, what's, what's typical for us to be thinking about is like, okay, I've got to make this, or I've got to make this putt, or I've got to make this shot. Like, don't screw this up. Like, you know, we can't lose this game, or I can't believe I just made that mistake, Right all of those really normal thoughts that really kind of jack up our stress and anxiety and distract us from what we need to be focused on. You know, it's like a golfer who's, and, and I, I work with a ton of golfers and it all sounds very similar when they come to me that, you know, they're standing over the ball in these high pressure situations thinking like, okay, I've got to make this, I've got to make this putt. I've got to make this putt. I've got to make this putt. Now, doesn't take, you know, a genius to figure out that when you're thinking, I've got to make this putt, you're giving yourself a really low chance of actually making the putt because our brains can only fully focus on one thing at a time. 
fully focus on one thing at a time. So when you're thinking I've got to make this putt, you're not thinking about what you need to be doing in order to actually make the putt. So instead, what that golfer then does is he replaces that I've got to make this putt, putt thinking, this problem focus, a results focus thinking with see the spot, soft hands, roll it in. See the spot, soft hands, roll it in. He replaces it by thinking about his process. We call this a performance mm. statement, but it's the two or three things that are really concise performance cues that keep you focused on what you need to do in order to give yourself the best possible chance of being successful. Now that takes training. It takes conscious effort, right? You can't just rely on going out there and hoping for the best because then you're going to be totally unprepared for these high pressure situations. So that advice that this guy gave you to go out there and replace that kind of, oh gosh, thinking, right? With, you know, I'm so lucky to be able to do this was really smart right? It's redirecting your thoughts onto what's going to not increase that heart rate, increase that kind of performance anxiety. Right. And what, you know, and this is going back to like, so one of the, the founders of coaching, Timothy Galway with, um, you know, the, uh, uh, I forget the name of the book. There's like the, you know, the, the tennis. Oh, book yes. About, the inner game of tennis. Of or... The, the yes. inner game of tennis. Yes. Right. Yes. And this idea of the inner game um, being that you're, you know, at a certain point, your body knows what to yes. do. Like I didn't, I didn't need any coaching on how to throw right. or how to catch. Yeah. Like my body, I've been playing this game since 1977. My body knows how to do those things. And when, when it's not being bothered by my approval seeking mind, it does them pretty well, right. pretty consistently. Right. Like there's not that many technical errors. Right. It's, it's all, all the technical errors are actually judgment. Errors. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the problem with that, though, is that if you're relying on that kind of absence of thinking, right, like, we all have that kind of in the zone. And this is something that um, sometimes takes a little bit of convincing with an athlete I'm working with. And this and I ask him, you know, what are you thinking about when you are performing at your best? Most of the time, they're going to mm. say, well, I'm not thinking about anything. Right? I'm just mm. in the zone, like I'm doing what I know to do. But Here's the thing. There is no magic pill or formula that will erase all thoughts from your, from your brain, from your mind. If there, were, if there was, mm. we would find it and I would be teaching everybody how to do it. There is no magic pill, no magic formula for erasing thoughts out of your mind. So you cannot just rely on that. And if you're relying on that in those kind of good low pressure situations, I can pretty much guarantee you that in the high pressure situations, there's going to be thoughts going through your mind, right? We can't mm. control all the time the thoughts that are going to go, come into our mind, but we can train our brains for being able to know what to do with them when they get there. And so we've got to use something called thought replacement. We can only fully focus on one thing at a time. So we've got to replace that negative results-based distracting overthinking with something that's going to help our performance. And we've got to be training for that in those low pressure situations, instead of just relying on that, like total lack of thinking so that it's there for you in those high pressure situations. Like my athletes are saying the same things to themselves every single day in training as they are when they're about to compete in the Olympics same thing. And so that is, you know, that's a the step one is is accurate there that, you know, when you don't have those kind of negative results based thoughts going through your mind, you can perform a lot better. But we can't just rely on hoping they're not there <laughs> and trying to get them trying mm. to keep them from coming in. We've got to have a game plan. We've got to have a tool to get them out. That's so interesting, because one, one of the things that was that I don't want to say it was an objection that when I was reading the book, but like a doubt. So I, I'm trained in yeah. ACT, right? Acceptance and commitment therapy. And one of the tenets is like, stop trying to control your uh -huh. thinking, right? Like when, you know, if I say to myself, oh, I'm going to have a great day today, then my brain immediately goes, well, compared right. to what? Compared right. to that shitty day you had two weeks, right. two, two right. weeks ago, right? So, so that this idea of like, you know, positive, you know, statements and like, no, I'm not going to think that. 
um, like yeah. off, typically backfires. Yeah. And yet you're, and, and you just said that, like, we can't control our right. thoughts. So I'm really interested in like, what's the intersection yes. of, of your thinking and the act thinking? Cause you are saying we can replace thoughts with other yeah. thoughts. Okay. So essentially when most people are trying to kind of quote unquote control their thoughts, it looks a lot like, don't think about that. Just let it go. Like, why am I thinking about that? Don't think about that, right? <laughs> that's because we haven't been trained really how to do it effectively. And so that's what most people do when they're trying to control their thoughts. Now, it's like telling you, you know, just don't think about a pink elephant. Whatever you do, don't think about a pink elephant. Of course, you're thinking about a pink elephant, even more so than had we not been telling ourselves not to think about it. And so with this acceptance and commitment therapy, kind of step one is recognizing that you're having the thought, right? Like recognize that it's there to kind of give yourself kind of one step, mm -hmm. take yourself one step back from it, which is actually really in line with this relentless solution focus. Step one, you've got to recognize what you're thinking. Because so much goes on kind of in our unconscious that we don't even recognize because we haven't really been taught kind of the cues. Like, how do we know when we're thinking mm. about something that's really affecting our health, happiness, and success in a negative way? And the way you know is by paying attention to the way you feel. Like, any negative emotion whatsoever, stress, anxiety, depression, fear, anger, all of these negative emotions are a cue it's like your biological alarm system that your mind is focused on a problem or something negative. Now, again, we've mm -hmm. just talked about that. You've got to replace it. You can't just tell yourself not to think about it. And that's what most people do when they're trying to control their thoughts. Again, they say, just don't think about it. Just let it go. Right. Like coaches say that all the time to their players, like, just let it go. Just shake it off. Right. We tell ourselves that all the time. Just yeah. let it go. Just don't think about it. But again, it's like putting a big highlighter over it. So we got to recognize it. And we've got to replace it with something else. And I think that um, this acceptance and commitment therapy, in a, in a way, it's very, I see how kind of like on paper, it seems to be counter, right? But in a way, I see them as very similar. We're replacing that kind of PCT tornado with, okay, well, let's recognize it. And let's kind of take one step back from it and say, I'm having the thought with, like you're redirecting the thought. Right. And that's essentially mm -hmm. what we're doing with relentless solution focus. We're redirecting it, though, in a way that's going to promote solutions. Like, what is one thing I can do that could help make this better? And for somebody, that solution might be I'm going to recognize that I'm having this thought and I'm going to say, you know, what's something typical that that you would say, like, I am having the thought that. Right. That right. might be the solution for mm -hmm. someone to say, okay, I'm going to recognize and I'm going to say this, mm. or I'm stressed because my, um, my like hitting seems to really, I, I seem to be kind of starting into this little bit of a slump with my hitting. So what's one thing I can do that could make this better. All right. I'm going to get to practice 10 minutes early tomorrow and I'm going to do some extra swings in the batting cage. So it doesn't matter what the solution is. What's important is that you're redirecting your thought to something, anything that could help improve that current situation by just one iota. So we can't yeah. always control what comes into our mind. You know, we're going to try, like I'm going to try with my, with my athlete standing at the plate, you know, and about to be pitched to, I want him controlling what he's, what's going through his mind. So he's saying to himself, track the ball, quick swing, follow through, right? To try to prevent that negative stuff from coming in. But we can't always prevent what, what's coming in. But we can always control what we put in there, right? What we're actively telling ourselves no. to help get rid of the stuff that doesn't serve us. Right. So that's, that's great. And I'm hearing a couple of things. One is like one of the big things of ACT is that we choose where our attention yeah. goes. Yes. Right. So, so it's not that I have to turn off the radio. Right. I just have to go closer to the yes. television that's saying the good totally. things so that so that uh, honoring that, OK, I've got this negative self-talk and when I'm fused with it, that's all there is. But once I step back and I can say, oh, that's I'm having the thought that then it immediately diminishes exactly. its, its hold on me. 
And the second thing is like the, 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 the third part, you know, or the, the second part letter of act commitment right. is like, okay, given where I am, what do I want to yeah. do? And so it sounds like those three, the, those three part phrases, soft hands, yes. pick the spot yes. or, yes. Swing, you know, eye on the ball become the commitment. Yes. yes. And it's actually, you know, it's a lot simpler. I say it's a lot easier with athletes. It, it's, it's interesting because in terms of like process goals, like that's the, the most important daily activities for you to be doing consistently and results as athletes, that's a little harder because you can be doing everything you should be doing on a daily basis, have the best game plan in the world. And then you get out there and somebody can still like beat your face in, <laughs> right? Like with athletics, it's yeah. just harder. It's harder to kind of control results in that way. But with business and with other things in life, it's so easy. Well, I should say it's so simple. It's not easy. It's so simple. You figure out what you need to be doing on a daily basis. You commit to doing it consistently. You're going to get the results. Now, when it comes to what we call performance statements or what we've been talking about in terms of kind of keeping those positive performance cues, that process focus in our mind, it's a lot easier in athletics. Like you can be, you know, standing at the, standing over the ball saying, see the spot, soft hands, follow through or see the spot, soft hands, roll it in, whatever your performance cues are for you. That's simple. That's it's, it's sports, right? It's entertainment. When we're talking real life stuff, like real anxieties, that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult in my opinion. Like in my own life, it's so much easier for me to implement this stuff in like my dancing than it is in my own life. And now I say yeah. harder, but I work at it every day, right? Like hard doesn't mean doable. You can learn to do it. You have to do the consistent training though. And we teach these in the book, the mental workout and the success log, things for you to do on a daily basis that literally help you rewire your brain to towards this type of thinking, because it's not going to happen naturally. Our brains are not wired for it. It's not normal. But just because it's not normal does not mean you can't learn to do it. And I lived that kind of normal way of life for, let's say, 25 years. And this way is so much better. <laughs> it's so much better. Um, but it, it takes relentlessness. And that's, you know, that's why it's not solution focused. It's relentless solution focused. Mm -hmm. so, so if I take, you know, think about some of my clients, um, like a lot, a lot of the people who come to me are they don't need any help with being right. smart or strategic or a great writer. Like they've got all the tools. That's why they're at the level where right. they can come get a coach like me. And what they have is like they lose their temper or they shut up in a meeting when they should speak up. And but, you know, for a lot of them, the issue is in their mind, it's about um, not doing mm -hmm. something. Right. Like in this, like the best thing they can do in that situation is just shut yeah. up. Right. Rather than rather than blurt with their thinking, which um, I, people find very hard to not yes. do something. So one of the things I work on with my clients is to re um, reconceptualize that into a positive action, something that you can do, like whether it's the yes. centering breath or a smile or asking yourself what what can I learn Absolutely. here? Absolutely. Right. Something positive as opposed to just inhibiting a, a, a negative Absolutely. habit. Absolutely. And I think what, yes. And what it's sounding like to me is like replacing that with something, right? It, inhibiting is hard, right? Yeah. And so even in, well, I'll, this is making me think of, um, you know, a few years ago, Jason was, um, I was kind of asking him for some feedback on like, we were starting to do, um, more podcasts and interviews and things like that. And Jason is just a fantastic speaker. Um, and I'm like, okay, what, what's one thing that you feel like um, I should work on? And he said, you know, this is one of the best pieces of advice that I got is to incorporate more pausing, pauses in your speaking. And he was asking me, you know, we we're kind of, it's hard, right? It's hard to allow there to be silence. And he's like, okay, Ellen, you know, I, I did a podcast or I had one coming up and I was like, okay, I'm really going to work on the, the pauses. 
And he said, okay, Ellen, now what are you going to replace it with? When, we, when you want to say something, what are you going to replace it with? And I was like, nothing. He's like, yes, exactly. You're going to replace it with <laughs> silence, right? <laughs> so even having that kind of active idea of replacing it with something, even if that something is silence, is so much more effective than just thinking, okay, stop talking. <laughs> mm. That's great. The other thing that I love about the story is your question, which is not like, tell me what, tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can improve, but tell me one thing Absolutely. to work on, right? So that's already so a solution focused Absolutely. approach. Right. Like, like here, like here's, here's my secret of, of, of coaching. Like, I think I do a lot of things well, but the one thing that my clients are consistently telling me was so helpful is when they come to me with, you know, and they're all in a state about something. And then I pause and I say, so what's the outcome you're going for here? And they go, oh. yeah, <laughs> like, like that's, you know, that's the yes. move, right? Cause that gets them thinking about what they want about a solution. And it's, you know, like for me, it's it's become something I've trained myself to do as part of my process. I love that. And it's mind blowing yeah. for people because it's so not. I love obvious. that. That's that's great. And the you know, what what I heard about that too is you're asking them a question. You know, you're a coach and you have a lot of the answers. <laughs> you know, you're you're very you're very <laughs> effective at this, which means that you have a lot of the answers for people. But you know, it, like based on kind of what you said too, that nothing is going to be more effective than asking them, getting people to think. Um, and you know, people have become so scared of evaluation. You know, even the word evaluation like kind of makes people go like this, like their hearts start racing. Evaluation is a scary mm. thing, which leads people to not do it or because they do it very ineffectively. Now, here's the thing, we're all evaluating ourselves constantly throughout the day, but most people are evaluating themselves in a very negative way where they're focusing on their shortcomings and really beating themselves up for it. And what we teach you to do is evaluate yourself using this solution-based approach through this tool called the success log, where every day you write down three things you did well that day, one thing you want to improve in the next 24 hours, and then one thing you can do that can help make that improvement. So remember, self-confidence is number one in importance in terms of how you're going to perform. And the more you're recognizing the little things you're doing well, the, it's like little, putting pennies into your piggy bank of self-confidence. And then instead of saying, just like you pointed out, mm -hmm. instead of saying, well, what did I screw up today? Where did I really fall short today? That's, people's, that's pe what people want to do. That's people's instinct, right? That's how we're wired. But you're forcing yourself in the success log to say, what's well, one thing I want to improve? Such an important and impactful difference than saying, well, what did I screw up today? And then, hey, here's what I want to improve. What's one thing I can do that can help make that improvement? Yeah, I, I love that. And I also love uh, just thinking about like you're right that people will will avoid objective evaluation while yeah. beating themselves up, which yeah. is kind of interesting. Like in an old career I had, I was a digital marketer. And so I would all, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to throw some tracking on your website and say, well, what's your conversion rate? What's your cost per customer? What's your cost per lead? What's, you know, all that stuff. And they wouldn't want, clients wouldn't want to do it because yeah. they didn't really want to know. They didn't want their noses yeah. rubbed in the hard numbers, even while they were consistently saying, right. what am I doing wrong? I'm failing right. as a business owner. I'm like, it's so interesting that, that somehow the soft, um, fuzzy self-condemnation feels less threatening than yes, actual numbers. absolutely. Well, and I like that you said kind of the soft fuzzy because I think that's how people think of self-confidence or recognizing what they're doing well. Like, well, that's soft. Like, oh, I'm going to really beat myself up and I'm hard on myself. That's what's going to bring me success. I'm like digging my heels in and I'm just going to work hard. And But here's the thing, that doesn't lead to you reaching your potential. It leads to burnout. It leads to low self-confidence. It leads to inaction. It's easy to beat yourself up. It's normal. Most people are really good at beating themselves up. 
but where the highly successful really put themselves apart, set themselves apart, is that they force themselves, they train themselves to focus on what they're doing well and what they want to improve. That is mental toughness. Mm, yeah, it's like you, when, you, when, you, when you're beating yourself up, you're actually letting yourself yeah. off the hook. Yeah. Right, because you're saying, well, this, this, is, who I, this is how I absolutely. am, so I bother. Totally, so level. totally, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to make sure I cover, th there's an objection that you cover extensively in the book, and I okay. still have it a little bit. <laughs> so, and I, and so, I, so I don't want to raise it as like a dichotomous either or, but sort of a, you know, when is this indicated? When is it contraindicated? Which is like you're saying, like, immediate, mm -hmm. like within a minute, start focusing on the solution. And the objection is, well, if I don't really right. understand the problem, if I don't spend time in the problem. So my process, the second step after we get to, you know, what's the outcome you want? And, they've, and, I, and I work with them to articulate like a positive, meaningful, clear outcome, something they can really picture in performance terms, is then we go back to the problem. And we explore what's causing it, when it when it arises, and it sounds like that's not what you guys well, recommend. So I would love I'd love to hear your thoughts on when, where, when, and when is that not useful? So for you to do. what I heard about your approach that sounds like it's really effective is that you started with what's the outcome, like what is you you immediately are thinking in terms of the solution, right? But that's a skip most or right. a, a, a step most people skip. Most people don't do that, right? And so they go immediately and they stay immediately and stay for a while in the problem. Like, you know, what's causing this? Like what, you know, and it turns into that tornado so that it becomes very difficult to even get to what's the solution or what's the next one inch of improvement I can make here. So I think you're already doing the hard work by asking that question, what's the outcome? right? What, what is the solution? Because then you're getting people in a mindset where they can think about, well, what is the next step, right? I know that this is, this is the, this is causing this thing. So what can I do about it? So I think in a sense you're doing it, you know, and, and I think that that is something that most people don't do. Well, I know that's something that most people don't do. They don't immediately say, okay, here's what I, you know, here's the, the solution. Here's the outcome that I want. Now, how do I get there? Most people get so stuck in ruminating on the problem that they don't even take that first step. All right. So you think it's all, it's all right once somebody's solution focused to then look at the problem within the context of where they want to go? Well, I think it would be, I think you have to in the sense of knowing what to do, right? Instead of, instead of, uh -huh. so I think we're, okay. I think what we're saying is we're looking at the situation right? To come up with the game okay, plan right. versus like, when I think of problem, I think of like, this is awful. What's the, you know, this is the negative, like, I can't believe this, right? And I think what, yeah. what, what, we're, what you're saying gotcha. is like the situation, you're looking at the situation to come up with what the next step is. Now, that's a really slippery slope, though. So I don't want people hearing this to think that that's your out to say, okay, well, I'm going to stay then focused on the problem because we really need to dig into this and figure out why exactly this is happening and let's dig into here and this and, and that because 99 times out of 100 the why isn't important it doesn't matter what's mm -hmm. causing it what matters is what you're going to do with, about it and people get so consumed with the why that they don't even take that first step 99 times out of 100 now i think that you you know you're an expert at this stuff right? So you have a skill set that most people don't have. So I would be really careful with saying, okay, well, I'm going to allow myself, you know, this much time to focus on the problem. 60 seconds, 60 seconds to recognize that your mind is focused on a problem. And then you start digging into what's one thing I can do that could help make this better. I hope that answered mm -hmm. it. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, so I just want to put, you know, sort of push it a little bit more, which is when, when I get, take people back. So the next question are, is what's happening now? And with the way I want them to answer that question is in terms of, of awareness, mindful awareness, as opposed so so I want them to describe it like it's a movie. So if someone's, you know, hitting poorly 
or someone's getting into conflict in a, in a meeting mm -hmm. constantly. Like, don't tell me like, oh, and then I was said such yeah. a stupid thing. I can't believe it. it was like, well, what did you say? And what were you feeling at that moment? And what was going through your mind? And what was, you know, let's let's take you there. Now feel it in your body now. So it's not so much right. the problem, but the I, I like your distinction about here's the situation totally. in which this arose. And at that point, 99 times out of 100, they go, oh, yes. I could just do yes. this instead. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Okay, so it's not, it's yeah, so it's not what my process is not sort of right. rumination, but separating judgment yes. from the facts so that totally. it becomes clear. And I would say too okay. that for the majority of people out there, again, they have you guiding them through that, right? And for someone kind of starting in on this journey without having, you know, the, the guidance through that, be careful right? Be careful because that can be this PCT is sneaky. It's sneaky. It's like, if you've ever caught yourself saying, well, let me just vent about it for one second. I'll feel better after I vent about it. Right. Or let me just tell you what happened. And then it starts to get really right. Like that, that tornado really starts to swirl. And so, yes, I, 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 I mm -hmm. think that that's a really good distinction. Like there's the situation so that you can figure out, okay, well, what's one thing I'm going to do about this. I know that my hitting, I seem to be pulling the ball to the left. Right. And, and I know I need to make this adjustment, but it's not seeming to be working. I know I'm pulling to the ball, the ball to the left. And then immediately, well, what's one thing you can do that could help make that improvement? Well, let me set up a meeting with my hitting coach, or I'm going to, I'm going to hit a hundred balls and I'm going to focus only on hitting them down the middle. Right. So they're understanding the situation enough so that they can come up with what to do. But again, 60 seconds, 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the other thing that I, I think is very similar in our approaches is, is our uh, uh, insistence that these are experiments, that there's no pressure exactly. that they succeed. Yes. Right. Like like if I try to hit down the middle and it turns out that it makes it worse, I celebrate totally that I've learned something as opposed to oh, totally. this, this didn't work. And then, you're, you know, if you think of your brain as kind of having a line drawn down the middle, and we've got a problem side and we've got a solution side. You know, we're on the problem side. Gosh, like my hitting, why is this? Uh, I'm pulling the ball left, whatever. Uh, we recognize your focus on the problem. What's one thing I can do that could help make this improvement? Okay, I'm going to set up a meeting with my swing coach um, or whatever. And let's say you try try that. You don't see any improvement. You're back on the problem side. Okay, I'm my swing, it's some, something's still going on here. I'm not hitting well. What's one thing I can do that can make this better? Well, I'm going to call him again, right? You're back over onto the solution side. That's good. We want to be on the solution side. You try that. It doesn't work. You're back on the problem side. It's okay. What's one thing I'm going to do that can make this improvement? Well, I'm going to start getting to practice 30 minutes early and I'm going to start, what you know, whatever the solution is, you're going to end up back on the problem side. That's okay. The goal is not to stay there for longer than 60 seconds. So when you are kind of pinging back and forth between mm -hmm. the problem and the solution, that's not a sign of failure. That's a sign of relentlessness. All you need to do is ask the question again, what's one thing I can do that could make this better? And as long as you don't allow yourself to stay there for longer than 60 seconds on that problem side, that's a win. In fact, it's a huge win. When you have one of those days or one of those problems where you're, you find yourself kind of going back to the problem side because what you're trying isn't working, that's where the relentlessness piece of this really comes into play. And that's where people really win consistently. Right. But you know, and the one caveat I would uh, offer to that is there's a way in which I've seen clients get relentless about keep trying the same thing more, yeah. bigger, better. And they're just, you know, because they're stuck. And, you know, so one of the things that I want to do by asking people very specific questions that get them looking at the problem is to be able to see it yeah. in a new way. So, for, you know, for example, the, you know, the way someone, a client might, might um, define their problem as on this, this team, there's a person on the team who's very conflictual and everyone's annoyed by this person. And, you know, when the outcome is I want them to stop being annoying. And when we explore it and get, you know, the outcome is I want a high performing right. team, which which then allows them to try a whole different set of things than 
Right. So there's a way that relentlessness can become <laughs> stubbornness as a, and can kind of block, cre well, block creativity. Well, and the thing about when our minds are focused on solutions, right, it opens our minds up to new possibilities, right? That which we focus on expands. So when we're focused on solutions, our creativity is increased, our intelligence is increased, because when we're focused on solutions, our brain, our body is releasing a whole set of positive performance enhancing neurotransmitters. Now, when we're focused on the negative, or we're focused on a problem to the point that it's making us feel negative emotion, our body is releasing cortisol, which totally limits creativity, it totally limits intelligence, it's really like a low dose poison coursing through our bodies that most of us unfortunately have way too much of. Mm -hmm. And so when we keep our focus on solutions, really just the biology of that opens our mind up to new solutions, that which you focus on expands. So I think as long as that relentlessness is targeted towards solutions, it's gonna be really hard to get stuck. Mm. Love it. Love it. So we're, we're at the hour. I want to make sure people know where uh, where to find you, where to find the book, uh, how they can work with you if this is, yeah. um, you know, struck struck a nerve and people feel like that uh, that this approach is yeah. something that well, can help them. So, uh, so the book is on, yourself, you know, you can please. get it wherever you get books, Amazon, you can go to relentlesssolutionfocus.com for more information on me and the book. I'm on Instagram, Dr. Ellen Reed, or just email me, ellen at jasonselk.com. Just email me if you have any questions or, you know, any, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but yeah, I'm out there. <laughs> uh, RelentlessSolutionFocus.com or ellen at jasonselk.com. Awesome. And fi final question, what's, uh, what does the next year hold for you? More books, so, more research, of, more, uh, what, what, any particular of types of clients you're looking on, for? working um, on something that I'm really excited about, sort of a, a workbook version of Relentless Solution Focus that I think people have been asking for. And so we're finally like, all right, let's do this thing, um, mm -hmm. which entails always kind of more research. We're always looking for ways to improve what we're doing. Um, beyond that, um, more dancing, more momming, <laughs> and more coaching. <laughs> All right. Sounds like a fun, full life. So Dr. Ellen Reed, thank, thank you. you so much for your contributions to uh, human health, happiness, and performance. And thank you well, so thank much. Thank you. For taking Ditto the time to you. Today. I know you really make a big impact on, on your clients and everybody listening to this. So I really appreciate the work that you do. Well, and I've just added another yeah. <laughs> another arrow to my quiver. So thanks so much for your work.